The most legendary folk tales about British motorsport make most people think of exuberant racing machines driven by only the most sophisticated of drivers. From Silverstone to Goodwood, the UK is and is best known for formula and sports car racing. The United States, however, for most people, only one thing comes to mind. NASCAR. Boogity, boogity, boogity! Let's go racing, boys! Out of turn two, Donnie Allison in first. Where will Kale make his move? He comes to the inside. Donnie Allison throws the block. Kale hits him. He slides. Donnie Allison slides. They hit again. They drive into the turn. They're hitting the wall. They're head on the wall. And Earnhardt is going for the lead. And listen to this crowd of 170,000 strong. It's an unbelievable situation in Indianapolis. Here he is in the fourth turn. This is his final trip around turn number four. And Jeff Gordon is about to write his name in the racing history books. Years from today when 79 stock car races have been run here, we'll remember the name. Jeff Gordon, winner of the inaugural Brickyard 400. It's going to be a drag race all the way back to the start finish line. No caution. They're side by side, right to the line. Big crash. Here they come. Checkered flag. Herbic. Kevin Herbic wins the Daytona 500. We got one car. And there's still Ruth coming across the start finish line. They're still wrecking. They're wrecking everywhere. And red meat. What if you were spotted eating a salad? Eating salad? The momentum. The contact. 18. They make contact. The 18 in the wall. They're side by side again. Going into three for the lead. Larson has the advantage. Here comes the 18. He puts the oh ball into the back goodness. of him. The 18 into the wall. The 42 sideways. Open Phoenix. Take a look at what he did. I have never seen anything you like that before in my you life. Made But what if I told you that American style stock car racing had landed in the UK over a quarter of a century ago and is still a fully breathing scene to be found today, created and expanded by bold, passionate, business minded individuals who sought to make the UK another amphitheatre for stock car racing and to win over the heart of the British people. Join me, Jay Powers, as we discover the untold and forlorn history of American-style stock car racing in the UK. This is V8 Thunder, the history and future of stock car racing in the UK. Up lap. This is the time when they can get their tyres a little bit warmed up, but uh, Barry Lee certainly doing that. Just the six cars on the track, but uh, imagine just in a month or so's time, the 16, 20 cars on the track, these cars really will look superb. They'll look, already look superb, and they'll look even better when there's uh, more cars on the track. When those, the pace car will pull off. The start has got control. He comes down with the green flag and this is the start of the first ever race for the Euro cars. All pretty closely together. Murray Lee already making a place up there, going on the inside of Mark Loveland in the car number 13 there. And now Alf Bohr has pulled off, so it's between now, between these two cars. These cars have to pull off. 
and just two laps to go this time round. So there's Kevin Clark in the lead. Can Barry Lee come right from the back? Can he do it? Can he? Can he get past Kevin Clark? He's going to do his best. Don't forget, he's only got one lap. He's trying on the outside. He's trying on the outside. Kevin's keeping the inside line. One lap to go, and can Kevin hold the inside line? No, he can't. Kevin's just been had his nose chopped off there by uh, Barry Lee, who's come right from the back. He'll come round now. I don't think Kevin's going to be able to get him. No, he's not. So Kevin Clark in second place, but the winner, and right from the back of the grid, is Barry Lee in the number one car, Dagenham Motors sponsored, the first Euro car shootout. Well, Euro car was basically the first attempt to do something NASCAR related in the UK. A guy called Sonny Howard, who was um, basically, a, um, he builds and runs lots of short oval um, events. He tried to bring the NASCAR look into mainstream motorsport, which is basically what Eurocar was. And racing on UK racetracks um, with a sort of NASCAR style, they were made to look like NASCARs. Eurocar was founded by Sonny Howard and began racing on the short ovals in 1994 before moving on to the big circuits in 95. It was the first time in British motorsport history that a race series attempted to authentically replicate American style stock car racing such as NASCAR. The V6 series was a body shell copy of Ford's Mondeo saloon car and Ford signed off on 36 of them for the 1995 season of by which the Eurocar series had taken the British motorsport scene by storm. Eurocar racing is the fastest growing motorsport in Britain. Based on American NASCAR racing, it features close regulations that keep all the cars very similar. In America, they do speeds of 200 miles an hour around Daytona. In Britain, there aren't tracks as big as Daytona, but here on the Mallory Park Oval, it's door-to-door -door racing at 130 miles an hour. The Mondeo 2.9 litre V6 engines produced an excess of 230 brake horsepower and could reach a top speed of 155 miles an hour, with the cars being made from space frame chassis, were rear wheel drive and ran slick tyres. You had that many of them that you know, we were able to do it. And you had two heats and a final, or three heats. Yeah, we had it three races, so they were all split up anyway. So there was only 20 on the grid at the same time. And we had different ways of doing it. Everybody had to go to the presentations and the points were done. Yeah, it was all unique. It was just so, so different. It just took motorsport, you know by surprise for a better way of describing it. Because what you'd done is you'd bought a load of rules and regulations that were in short oval racing and you bought it into, you know, and if you take it overall, how much money have we ended up bringing into, into purist motorsport, if you like, into Motorsport UK? There's loads and loads of it because even now you're taking people from short ovals and now they've ended up now spending money within Motorsport UK and ended up being the clubs as well. And also we still do it because there's not many championships that will take on people from short oval racing because they think that they're all banger drivers and they're not. And most of them have got so much talent, so much talent. And more importantly ends up being is that they are show men and women as well. And because of that, they're able to put on a show because they're used to it, you know. At that time, Rockham had even ended up coming on the scene, so therefore the only real, real over we had was Mallory Park. So we worked with the Overins, who ended up, who ended up accepted it and ended up helped us to end up making it grow, and we ended up having a licence to end up running it the wrong way round as well, which is a, another important factor to it. That's because, to maintain the American-style stock car racing image, the cars had to run anti-clockwise on the oval, like their American brethren. Then in 1996, Eurocar introduced an all-new Premier Series, the Eurocar V8s. 
The 230 horsepower V6 Eurocars have become a familiar sight on the British motorsport scene since their introduction a couple of years ago. Based on the American NASCAR formula, the purpose-built space frame chassis are clad in a glass fibre Mondeo body shell. But surely NASCAR is all about V8. So Eurocar have introduced a new V8 category. The same basic principles, but now a totally new body shape and a 450 horsepower V8 under the bonnet. The engines are prepared by Roush Industries in America and are claimed to vary in output by no more than 6 horsepower. They're mounted much further back in the chassis than the V6s to give better handling, helped by the much beefier 12-inch wide tyres. And just listen to that sound. The 96, 97 and 98 Eurocar V8 seasons saw a great rivalry between Mike Jordan, Barry Lee, Kevin Clark and Stevie Hodgson break out with Jordan winning the 96 and 97 seasons while Hodgson, after winning the 97 V6 series, won the 98 V8 season. Elf Bora come along board as well, and then Paul Radishy, who used to drive for the touring cars, he ended up driving one who was an invitation driver. Um, and the list just goes on, Mike Jordan, Pete Chambers, um, the big one was ended up being Kevin Clark and then once they got there we were right at the end of a recession then, the recession that we really had before and we come out of that. The cars were cost effective, Ford's ended up giving it the support that it needed in the fact that they give us a bit of paper to say that we could copy that model and then at that point it just went on. It was big, it was definitely big. And we've got photos still about now with Brands Hatch, you know, with grids. And I don't want to, it will sound very disrespectful, but the, but the walkabout grids were far, far bigger than ended up even that the, the, the touring cars even get or whatever now. It was just that big. a hole in the market here for something like ASCAR uh, and we're only too happy to oblige. It brings a new era of spectator orientated motorsport to Europe. The car is the business. It's uh, exactly what we wanted. Um, we've been looking as you know for a car that will do both road and oval circuits and this is it. I think um, when it was announced last year that uh, they were building this uh, fantastic new motorsport facility at Rockingham in the Midlands uh, with the one and a half mile bank speedway, uh, I think it was logical that it would follow that a number of championships would emerge uh, to take advantage specifically of that facility. Uh, we're very happy that ASCAR is kind of leading the way in that. Yeah, the car is superb. It's everything we expected it to be. Uh, it's the first time I've seen it in the flesh. I've obviously seen lots of drawings from uh, nuts and bolts upwards. But yeah, it's everything we thought it was going to be. The car is the business. It's uh, exactly what we wanted. Uh, we've been looking, as you know, for a car that will do both road and oval circuits. And this is it. How many cars like this do you think race fans could expect to see running on the oval? I'd like to think that we'd see 40 plus. Um, obviously, it's up to the governing body when they finally license the circuit, when it's complete. Uh, but I, I don't see why we shouldn't see fields of 40 plus. I think we will always perceive this to be predominantly an oval track series. So it's, it's uh, safe to say that the majority of our races um, will be on the, the Bank Speedway at, at Rockingham. That's the way we, we see ourselves going forward. However, we are planning obviously taking in some road course races next year. Um, and we'll be looking around the country to find suitable venues to do that. ASCAR, the Anglo-American Stock Car Racing Series, later known as Days of Thunder, and then the Stock Car Speed Association, or SCSA for short, was Britain's answer to NASCAR in the US. With 20 plus V8 powered stock cars roaring round the newly built Rockingham Motor Speedway at speeds exceeding 140 miles an hour, in front of tens of thousands of enthusiastic British fans, most of which had never seen a stock car race like this in person before. The Ascar races at Rockingham were usually 60 lap races around a D shaped oval with a mandatory pit stop halfway through the race. 
Hello and welcome to the grand opening of Rockingham Motor Speedway, the UK's first ever US style racing circuit. The Mintex Cup from ASCAR is the first championship ever designed to run on a speedway track in this country. ASCAR was very different because we built an oval to run it on. Um, I remember standing in welly boots and a hard hat on turn one at Rockingham in 2000 when, it, when they were laying the tarmac and we were all extremely excited that we were going to get a proper American style oval in the UK and we were going to get our own stock car series to run on it. So let's take a look under the skin and see what makes these cars so special. It's a steel chassis and fiberglass body which means they weigh in at a hefty 2400 pounds or 1100 kilos. Underneath the hood is an impressive Chevy V8 with 565 horsepower. And when all that power, over four and a half times as much as an average family saloon, is delivered to the rear wheels through the solid rear axle, these machines are awesome to watch and to drive. The driver roster from its inaugural season in 2001 through to 2008 was stacked with a diverse list of talent to say the least, including V8 Eurocar champions Stevie Hodgson and Mike Jordan, multi-time national hot rod champion Colin White, Ben Collins, also known as the Stig from Top Gear, multi-time British touring car champion Jason Plato, WRC champion Colin McRae, the list goes on and on. These are great racing drivers, and I said that to you earlier, they're fantastic, they're fast, um, and it, I think in time, we get 30, 40 cars out there, it's going to be an awesome show. There are a lot of pluses from As for Ascar, there was a lot of good racing. And another new name on a car, this time with a difference. American rap star 50 Cent has his name on a car and is performing post-race at Rockingham. So Stevie, it's a million dollar prize fund for Days of Thunder, how come you only ended up with 50 Cent? Well, I think I drew, I drew the short straw, didn't I, really? <laughs> but, uh, no, it's great for the team, great for Renegade, you know, to have someone like 50 Cent on the car in the G unit. It's fantastic, you know. You better be careful, he's a dangerous man, you know. He might kill you with hip-hop. Well, we're from Manchester, so we're, you know, we're not scared of these foreigners, are we? You're really hard. <laughs> and here's the reason why... Sadly, the day so ended early for them. ...and spins him out and clatters into the wall. Ascar should have been what catapulted stock car racing into the British market. It had everything. American style stock cars, loud V8 engines, a talented driver roster. Europe's largest purpose built oval racetrack as its playground. But what Ascar also had was a lot of problems. Problems that would eventually lead to its demise by 2008. Later on, I'll reveal what came of both the Eurocar and Ascar series. Hi, I'm Steve O'Donnell. As NASCAR's Executive Vice President and Chief Racing Development Officer, I'd like to invite all our great friends in England out to the American Speed Fest 3 at Brands Hatch on June 6th and 7th as NASCAR stock cars once again tackle one of Europe's most historic racetracks. In just three short years, the NASCAR Wheel and Euro Series has become a can't miss event throughout Europe. And the June weekend at Brands Hatch is one of the highlights on the calendar. Headlined by NASCAR's official European Racing Series, American Speed Fest brings the sights and sounds of the American culture, from live music to hot rods and custom cars on display for the whole family to enjoy. NASCAR is proud to bring the door-to-door, fender-banging, high-speed excitement of the NASCAR Wheel and Euro Series in England, and I look forward to seeing everyone there. This is, a, this is an absolutely exciting event for us in NASCAR. Um, walking through this, this, this event is what NASCAR is all about. It's close side-by-side -side racing. It's a lot of fan engagement. Um, if you look around here, fans are walking around. They're having a great time. There's a lot of families out here. So it's a great day for NASCAR uh, in Europe. The experience here today at Brands Hatch has been, it's been refreshing. It's been exciting. It's also very similar to what you see back in the United States. Uh, the thing that we always try to do at, all, at NASCAR races is make it something that, in addition to the racing that it's a fan friendly and a family friendly event. So for us to be here today and see a lot of engagement in the midway, you see families walking around enjoying racing and more importantly enjoying NASCAR style of racing. It's, it's something exciting for us. It's something we're excited to be a part of and it's, uh, it's a great day to be out here. 
NASCAR Euro Series was founded by French organization Team FJ in 2008, originally calling it Race Car Euro Series and was a French-only series at first before being expanded across Europe in 2011 under the FIA. NASCAR agreed to sanction the series in 2012 before renaming the series in 2013 to the NASCAR Wheel and Euro Series as it is still known today. These stock cars are powered by a gas-guzzling 5.7-litre V8 engine that makes 400 brake horsepower utilised by a four-speed dogleg gearbox and held together by a tubular chassis. The sole UK venue that's played host to the NASCAR Euro Series since 2011 is Brands Hatch, announcing earlier this year a contract extension with the series to 2028. I was lucky enough to attend this year's NASCAR Euro Series Brands Hatch round for the first time and take it in for myself. So I, um, I kind of came across NASCAR in kind of 2010, 2011, when I was, uh, when I was still going to, to school um, in the mornings, there was a channel on Sky called Motors TV, which it seems every, every morning before I went to school would either be V8 Supercars or NASCAR Xfinity or Nationwide at the time, um, showing the, the kind of race replay from the week before. So I, I started watching those and, and just became a bit obsessed with NASCAR. You know, the, it's obviously so different to any form of racing we had here in Europe. And uh, at those at that time, you know, the cars were seven, 800 horsepower, even for, for nationwide, obviously super raw, um, really, really good racing. And uh, it just was something that I'd love to have a go at. You know, it looked so on edge, the cars sliding around, you know, just it looked like so much fun. So from that point, I, I started to follow NASCAR more and more and more and probably 2011, 2012 for the first years where I really kind of followed, you know, cup nationwide trucks and, uh, and, and paid attention to what was going on. And yeah, from there, it was like, this is something I needed to do. Le Mans was always my goal from when I started racing. I went to Le Mans as a kid and that's really what kind of captivated me with race cars but NASCAR then quickly kind of reached equal status as the two things that I wanted to, to tick off before I can retire from racing happily. So I think that how unique NASCAR is in motorsport is the thing that kind of drew me to it the most. Hi everyone I'm Alex Sedgwick driver of the number 24 NBA 2K21 Camaro in the uh, in the NASCAR Euro Series this weekend at Brands Hatch. To this day, a British driver has yet to win a race in the Euro's Premier Series, the Euro NASCAR Pro Series. I caught up with British professional racing car driver and former NASCAR Euro Series driver Alex Sedgwick to see what opportunities the Euro Series offers fans and drivers. Sedgwick competed in the series from 2018 to 2021, notching up 11 top 10 finishes from 20 starts. The interest in the NASCAR Euro Series was all from US NASCAR. So, so from watching that, and I mean, even since I started racing in, in cars, I was already looking at ways or routes to get to the US. Um, the, the issue, like most people face, is that the, the budgets for someone with no kind of um, no record, no, no kind of history racing a stock car is, is super high. So um, the Euro Series came as like a nice opportunity to bridge that gap and hopefully build some connections and, and use it as a, a springboard to getting to the US. And mm -hmm. end of 2017, they did uh, what they called the, the driver recruitment program, which was uh, a series of tests where you could, they invited um, what they, who they decided were their best prospects out of, I think, about 120 drivers that applied. I was invited to one of the tests. And they, they gave you a few runs in one of the Euro series cars. You had a couple interviews and they gave some, some drivers from those tests, some financial support to enter the series. So that's kind of what led to me racing in the Euro series that, you know, the series itself was able to support me with some funding. Um, and I was able to put some sponsorship together to bridge the, the rest of the budget. And then that was, yeah, sort of how my, how my NASCAR career started. Yeah, that was a, an awesome 
deal you know the especially having the kobe bryant tribute car with sort of the the yellow and purple was was an amazing livery yeah i think the biggest thing with the euro series is if you're viewing it as a career step to move to the us like it's almost more important on the networking side versus track performance so you know you have an opportunity to be in front of a lot of nascar personnel a lot of people who can make introductions for you obviously you need to perform on track or and you need to be competent otherwise there's no point but um you know that side of things is invaluable you know if you have allies in your corner and people that can you know help open those doors that's that's really the the true benefit of, of being there you know the the euro series itself is not a a place you can kind of make a long-term racing career and get paid but it's a good stepping stone to uh to something else if you can kind of utilize it properly i think it definitely does help you know for me the the connections i made through the euro series and to get a little bit of recognition as a nascar driver was really helpful to open doors to do things in the us to be able to have a little bit of a record as i've driven cup not cup cars i've driven stock cars i've done decently at it is is very very beneficial and you know also nascar international puts a lot of effort into it so i was able to meet people within nascar i i went and did a trade show with representing nascar in the uk at autosport and that side of things was really invaluable to get you know some people within nascar as an organization kind of that can give you recognition for europe like obviously it's still very niche like not a lot of people know a, there's a NASCAR series here and B, or in Europe and, and B, that, you know, there is routes to go and do stuff in the US. So there's a lot of explanation that went into it. And then in, in the US, obviously NASCAR is racing for a lot of people and they don't know anything else. So um, it's cool that they see that, you know, there's interest from elsewhere in the world and especially for me being in the UK and for a period of my career being so kind of all in on on NASCAR um that you know people from outside the US you know are so interested and so keen in getting involved and I think that's only growing over time and you know even from my short time in the Euro series I saw a lot more um a lot more interest from kind of I guess like non-traditional routes to or, or areas um, wanting to be involved in NASCAR or wanting to become NASCAR drivers. And, you know, everybody there has some form of interest in NASCAR and doing things in the US. Um, yeah, it is grown. And I think when I first came into it, it's probably, you know, a few years prior to that to now, it's had a massive growth spurt and, and a lot more recognition. You know, the, the event at Brands Hatch has more spectators than spectators and touring cars which is pretty crazy for a, a uk race event so there's a lot of interest in it for sure it's just uh a case of kind of where it goes from here because i think they're they're risking kind of stagnating and just kind of falling into you know this is where they're at so it's going to be interesting to see how they continue to innovate or how they continue to move the series forward Ever wanted to have a go at American style stock car racing, but at an affordable rate? You can in the American Cup Cars UK race series. Running since 2007, it can be described as a NASCAR on a budget race series using miniature scale NASCARs on the short ovals. I went to the third round of the Midlands Championship at Hensford Raceway to find out more about it. I'm Steve Stamford, I'm the owner and um the coordinator and the runner of American Cup Car Racing uh, UK, uh, which is basically a two-third scale NASCAR car that are all imported from the US. Um, we race on various ovals. I started off in the Remy, uh, ex, um, I'm ex-Army, um, a Remy, I've come out of the Remy, and um, I, I just uh, as a mechanic got into motorsport in uh, grassroots racing and to, uh, into autograss. Um, and I, I, I've always liked NASCAR, I was always a, a fan of NASCAR and uh, went to the States and seen these in the States, heard about a series that was over here, that there was a, a man over here that actually owned a few of the cars, uh, got in touch with him in the UK and ended up building the series what it is now. Uh, and then on the back of that, we've built up the junior series as well, which are for eight to 16 year olds. 
They're all uh, purpose-built chassis, um, fiberglass bodies, um, various shapes of bodies. You've got uh, uh, Taurus, Ford Taurus, you've got um, Camaray, Monte Carlo, uh, all NASCAR um, sort of specification. Um, Winter's quick change axle, so you can change the gearing in the back of the axle. And they're running um, a Yamaha Superbike engine in the front with um, restrictions. The shock absorbers are all fully adjustable shocks all around on the cars. And we were on a, a control slick tyre and wet tyre, as you can see today, where we've been running the wets because we had a downpour earlier and all got drenched. But yeah, so um, yeah, the, the, the tyres are all restricted for the drivers as well. Um, basically, it's a one make series for all the, the drivers. Cars have got a weigh in at um, 1,500 pound, including the driver after a race. Um, there's various other um, restrictions in place, like wheelbase, track width, and all the rest of it. So um, it's it's quite a tight formula. Um, basically, it, it, it's not a checkbook racing formula. It's it's a restricted formula that um, your time in the garage and setting the car up, and then your driver ability, what counts. So I'm Ben Lim. I'm the driver of the number 19 American Cup car. Um, I've been in the sport since 2020. Um, first thing I've raced, I've not raced anything else. Um, straight in on the ovals. I'm driving the car, it was a steep learning curve, to be honest. Um, when I got in it, it was a case of literally, it was like learning to drive again. So um, start at the beginning, the, the car's a bike engine, so um, the gearbox is sequential um, rather than the normal H pattern that we're used to on the roads. Um, the slick tyres take a little bit of warming up, um, but once they're warm, they've got a bit more grip than, than your normal road tyres. So yeah, it was it was just a real steep sort of learning curve. And uh, when there's 20 other cars around you all trying to go as fast as they can, uh, it's uh, you're half, half learning, half staying out the way for your first few races. Um, and then, um, yeah, you progress, you get faster as you go, you get more time in the seat. And um, yeah, take it from there. Um, I've, I've gone on to win races, championships, and um, yeah, really enjoying it. So we had, um, we started off well, the, um, the car was understeering a fair amount in the first race, um, but it sort of got better as the race went on. Um, managed to get up to third in the first race. Uh, and had a, a minor incident with another car towards the end, um, and uh, I was docked two places. So we, we got a fifth in the first race, but uh, with good points and kept the car relatively clean. Uh, the second race, um, again, we were going well. Um, the car in front, um, <laughs> the engine decided to expire, so um, laid oil all over the track, and um, we both uh, had a visit to the fence. Um, not great. Um, we didn't damage the car too badly, fortunately. Um, but, yeah, it, uh, it ended our race there. Um, and that gave us a decent grid position in the final. Um, the way the grids work in cup cars is... Um, it works on a running average, so if you're not doing as well in certain races, um, that puts you further towards the front. If you start winning a lot of races, they put you further to the back. So it, it works pretty fairly in, in, um, in the grid positions. Um, so because we didn't have great results in the first two races, it meant we had a, a decent grid start in the, uh, in the final. Um, unfortunately, we had a, a torrential downpour about 10 minutes before the race. Um, we managed to get it onto the wet tyres, um, but in a, in a race that's that wet, it's, uh, it's a case usually of just bringing the car home, make sure you don't damage the car and don't try too hard. Um, otherwise you end up causing yourself damage and costing money. It's a NASCAR for a budget oval racer. Um, one of these cars you can, uh, I know for a fact, you can run it on a budget of about two and a half thousand pounds per season. Um, and that includes your tyres. It doesn't include your, your travelling backwards and forwards to the meeting, but obviously that's just the expenditure on the car. So yeah, it's a very affordable formula um, and um, it, great fun. But they are quick, very quick cars. Yeah. So unfortunately in the States, I hate to say it, but these have sort of um, filtered out. The, the, the series is more or less non-existent in the States. So what we've done over here, we've actually got copy chassis, copy bodies, got the, uh, basically everything is available. Um, through our partners in the States, because obviously we've got um, relationships in the States with suppliers of bits and bobs, but everything else is, is, is sort of produced now in the UK. So we've, we've done that. Uh, we've done that really to cover ourselves. We, we, I, I, I sort of got the gist about two or three years ago when a new bloke took it over there that it wasn't going in the right direction. So I, I moved in a, a, an opposite direction of, of um, 
basically making the parts up in the UK. Again, it cuts out the cost of importation and um, uh, and the expense of um, shipping. Yeah. We, we had that glitch with COVID, obviously, but through COVID, we actually had a, still added growth. Um, and uh, we're going, we're, uh, things are tight in the UK at the moment because it's an affordable series, because it's so restricted, people are looking to, to down, down size their expenditure within motorsport so this is what we're all about we spend more times keeping the cost out of the sport than what we do adding costs in one of the greatest things that we're very proud of is our rule book tells you what you can do there's no hidden secrets in there there's no it basically says that um, if it's not listed or it's not mentioned in the rule book then you can't do it so there's no hidden agenda in the rule book. So you haven't got hidden costs in there or anything like that. It's all open in the, the past. It's, it's all the same for all the drivers. My name's Mark, Mark Trevathan. Um, race number 21 in the American Cup car series. Um, I've been around oval racing for a lot of years, um, but fairly new to this series. So we can't just buy new tires, you know, the, the whole time through the season. We're really strictly limited on the number of tires we can buy. The cars are pretty fuel efficient. As you can see, they're pretty space efficient. They're going to fit in the average uh, guy's garage, um, you know, and they're pretty easy to transport. We've not got a, a lorry or a coach. We just take it behind the works van, you know, so that's what we do. So I think it is, it is a good sort of budget formula um, in that regard. Yeah, there's a lot of variables with these cars from um, how you look after the engine, but also, yeah, the, the setup, you know, I won't bore you with the details, but yeah, you're into corner weights, you know, caster, camber, braking bias, um, you know, the, the tracking and the top drivers, which I definitely am not, um, but the top drivers, yeah, they will vary. They'll know exactly what change to make at each circuit because they've been through that learning curve. Once you come off track or once you're on track, it's, there's no feeling like it. There's no feeling like it. It's just, it's an amazing adrenaline rush and it, you don't have to win. You know, it, you don't need to, because let's be honest, what, what were the 18, 20 of us out there today? Yeah, you know, only one of us is going to win the final, you know, and today it wasn't me. Um, but that's okay, because I, I, I know what I want to do as a driver and I know where I want to improve. We're running an average like 20, 22, 24 cars, do you know what I mean, per grid, but which is, which is great on the short oval. And it, it, as you've probably seen earlier today, it, it looks quite spectacular. Mini NASCAR in the UK. I, I think, like I say, next best alternative, you sat here, two thirds scale one, <laughs> come and have a play. Do you know what I mean? What ended up happening is because it, it, because it was under the BRSCC umbrella, then there was a management change there and they ended up, tried to end up selling the package to somebody else. They tried to end up selling the package. They wanted us out of it, if you like, for whatever reason, maybe because we were too strong a personality, maybe because we had too much to say, I don't know, but they wanted us out. The, get, the teams had grown with it, but then suddenly we'd got these V8s, but they'd got a V6, they'd got a V6 size transport, and now suddenly we needed to end up trying to make a car that would fit in that transport. So when we come up with a V8, it had to fit in the same vehicle, and that's why that it always looked a bit short, why it should have been bigger, but it was because they ain't got the vehicles for it. So that's why we ended up making them a bit dumpy, if you like, to what they what they should have been. They should have had more frontage and a little bit more boot, but that was the reason, so that they'd go in the same transport as a V6. When they got introduced, they, they, it was too soon. It was too soon, but by that time, my colleague in business, if you like, Philip Bond, had ended up, done a, come to an arrangement with BRSCC and it should have not ended up going down that path and then it was a push 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 job it was all too too soon but unfortunately there was other people there there was other people sitting on the board and everything else and they were pushing for it so and that was where the transition ended up happening so BRSCC were then left with the V6s and the V8s I think at that point there was talk about Rockingham ended up happening as well, so they thought that there was going to be a big sale there. 
and it ended up not happening. They put a different management team in that didn't, they didn't even understand the drivers. They had no idea how they operated, how they worked, even their mental thinking at all. And at that point, it fell apart. Was it a success? Yes, it did end up working. It ended up, it had all of the right bits to it, but what it didn't end up in, it needed to end up having the finances behind it and it needed to end up having the infrastructure to be able to do it. We used to end up having team meetings. We had loads of them down at Roush when we were down there with them. They were ended up good meetings. We used to have meetings with all of the key sponsors that were with the V6s, with the V8, sorry. And they did end up also supporting as part of their package, the V6s as well. So, And it should have been just left alone and allowed to just mature and grow and everything else would have happened. Uh, a bit of a difficult situation with the ASCAR race series. Um, we have a brand new series on what is a brand new facility and uh, we haven't had an opportunity with ASCAR to run as much as we would have liked on this oval. We've just, we, we, we had our spring training scheduled for four weeks ago. The spring training was moved. In fact, we actually ran our spring training, which is the first time our cars got to run on this racetrack last week. That running inevitably showed up some, some small problems in the, uh, in the engine department on our race cars. These are not insurmountable problems, but given the amount of time that we had between uh, spring training and today, we decided that rather than risk not having a show, which was the other option that we had, was to say, listen, these problems exist. Either we put all the cars back in the truck and go away, was to actually put a show on today. So the race today is actually going to be a demonstration of the potential that ASCAR has. No, I don't think so. I think they've been extremely sensible. Um, they, it's the first time in the last few days that the Ascars have run on an oval because there hasn't been one for them to run on. And they're concerned about um, uh, engine temperatures and oil temperatures and they don't want to risk running for the full uh, length of the race. So they've been making a very sensible decision. And they've got some things to sort out with their organisation as well. So this is a really good test day for them and I'm happy with that. Our side ended up being more over the technical side because the point that we were asked to get involved then there was loads of rogue engines being run out there. The, the cars were continually, continually ended up in the wall. They were having accidents. You know, the, the whole thing was, it was exciting. It had all of the right drivers to it, but it just, it didn't end up gelling, you know. Then when we ended up having a car, they bought one here. They bought us a car here to SHP to end up, well, I asked for them to bring it one and have a look at And then suddenly what had ended up happening was it was just such a small thing, but it was a technical thing that ended up being, and, and they were on a pan arm rod. They were mounted on a pan arm rod, except it was on the wrong side for what oval racing was about. And then when they questioned America about it, they said, oh no, with well, the cars that you bought, were ended up being circuit cars. They were meant to go both ways. They, they weren't. So what had ended up happening was we come up with a conversion. We let the teams do it. We didn't get involved in it at all. And then suddenly the accidents started to stop happening. Also, we ended up putting alignment, alignment pickup points onto the chassis. And then at that point, the, the cars were ended up able to build stagger into them. And suddenly we ended up seeing all of these accidents stop. But by that time, it had ended up hurting it. It isn't about Sonny Howard. It isn't just about, you know, SHP. But they were the, they ended up coming up with a solution. But by that time, they had spent so much money and ended up spent that much money to end up having different drivers in them and everything else that when suddenly it ended up having to go fall in line with Purist Motorsport, then suddenly it, there wasn't the same interest there. And then when the stock cars ended up dwindling, if it's the right word, down to 12, 14 and even less, then at that point, you know, they should have been the ones that were the start act and the pickup should always be the support act, if you like, but it didn't end up being. That suddenly got changed over. The problem happened was when Rockingham decided not to pour as much because for a long time they were there was a lot of behind the scenes financing of the Ascars. 
And when Rockingham started pulling out of that, that's when the problems really started and the field started dropping away. For a while, there was a very good and very involved core of around 20 or so ASCAR drivers who were, you know, they, they were really making the races good. But once they started to drop away, like any series, you know, if the money's not there anymore and you're struggling to find it, then you're going to go and do something, something else you can afford. There was talk about taking the Ascars to other places. They could have taken them to other ovals. They could have run at the Mallory Mile because they run on one mile short tracks in the US. In fact, they run on half mile short tracks in the US. Um, there was a talk at one year of running them at the Abingdon Air Show on the runways and the taxiways. And if you can build an oval at an air, uh, at an airfield and that again and so you could have brought more variety into the series and i think if you brought more variety in the series that would have helped bring more entries into it as well so it's very easy to talk in hindsight it was great when we were there uh, i spent a year in the middle of it as a journalist working in the series and it was absolutely great we even had american style official uh, uniforms bright red with official written on the back that looked like they come straight out of NASCAR, you know, and I thought I, I thought it was about 12 foot tall when I was strolling down the pit lane with one of those on. So it was great when it was there, but behind the scenes, it wasn't being done in a way that it was going to survive. I know a few drivers who competed in it, um, and it, it on paper, it seemed like a great concept and like it it definitely had legs and interest but i think like a lot of things in in uk motorsport was just probably not handled and managed the best and obviously that ultimately led to it sort of falling apart which is a shame but um but no a, a really good concept and it would have been amazing to have that you know say 10 years later when i could have had the opportunity to race in it and then seeing what that could have led to i think um it was just a shame realistically that it never really took off it was simply a case of uh, the money tree dried up. And once the money tree dried up, then you know what's going to happen after that. Alf Bullard was so close, so, so close to making that work that it was not true. They still was not able to sell that oval story to the to, twofold, to end up being, to get more competitors or to end up getting it the other way round ended up being is to to get more people through the gate. But they had some good people at Rockham, really, really good people in the office, you know, but, you know, I can mention them all, but, it, you know, and they all ought to be mentioned for what they done because they lived and breathed it, lived and breathed it. But unfortunately, I couldn't get the people through the gate. Launched in 1997 as a support series for Eurocar, Sonny Howard's pickup truck series has been trackside ever since, racing as a support series during the Ascar era before racing alongside other serious race series on weekends throughout the year. The trucks have tubular space frame chassis, two litre engines producing 230 brake horsepower and weighing at just 900 kilograms. The pickup truck racing series has proven to be competitive and sustainable alike with full grids for the 2023 season. BRSTC wanted the V8s to end up happening, but at the same time as that was happening, we were already building pickup trucks. It was worldwide promoters at Live Nation that took an interest in Howard's pickup series. And they ended up running the monster trucks in America as well in the stadiums. They ended up showing an interest in pickup trucks. So at that point, what ended up happening was that because of what was happening at BRSCC, then Robert Fennell with Dennis Carter ended up said, we will end up taking the pickup trucks. And at that point, the pickup trucks made the transition from there being BRSCC to BARC. And at that point, we were then delegated, if that's the right word, with Ian Watson to end up being the business manager, the, also as far as race manager, or not race director, if you like, is concerned, with 
to, to, to look after and, and steer, mentor, if that's the right word as well, pick up trucks into this new generation. But we knew that the pick up trucks was definitely the way that we wanted to go, even though everybody was telling us that it wouldn't ever ever work. And here we are now, how many years on? I don't know, was it 27, 28 years on now? And we're still there, aren't we? And I would say even the trucks now, the pickup trucks as they stand now, they are show people. They're not A follows B on lap C or they end up making the statement, oh, you took my line when you went into the corner and everything else. That doesn't happen. You know, you, they put on a show. At the end of it all, sometimes there is a few tears. But overall, generally, they accept that that's what it's all about. There were a lot of short oval people in, um, well, there were a lot of short oval people in Ascot and there were a lot of short oval people in other UK motor racing championships, championships I covered before Ascot came along. And, um, but yeah, Ascot did um, hoover up a lot of them because, you know, people like Stevie Hodgson, they loved racing on the full blown ovals, but um, they still weren't able to make it stick. And at the end of the day, it didn't stick. We've left the V8 Eurocar series now. Um, a bit sad really in doing it because we've been here a few years, but obviously I've got plans now in America to run in the NASCAR bus series, which is looking... With the big boys, yeah. With the big boys, yeah, and uh, it's looking very promising. Excellent. Are there a lot of Brits going out there? No, I'll be the first ever one to race in it. When, really? When the deal comes off, yeah. Ah, oh, sp superb, superb. What kind of stuff are we talking about over there then, as far as like bigger prize money? Um, yeah, I mean, as in with America, the all um, motorsport facility is all based around itself, really, yeah. and it generates so much hype, more than what it does over in England. And um, obviously, then there's the money that comes with it as well. But that isn't as main thing at the minute. His main thing, obviously, is to go out and win some races. End of 2020, so November 2020, obviously the best time to try and travel and. Uh, do a race in in the US. So yeah, it was a uh, was very random in a way how that all came together. So I, I obviously did the Euro Series 2018, 2019, 2020. Even without COVID, I was kind of I had nothing. You know, I had no budget left. Unfortunately, the the team I raced for in in the Euro Series shut down. So I was left with kind of a a no plan and and just kind of had to see what what came and obviously COVID happened which in a way was you know for me kind of a obviously not on the great scheme of life a good thing but for racing a good thing because it meant that everybody else ended up with nothing as well so um so yeah it gave me a chance to really sit and kind of figure out what I wanted to do and obviously on that that list of things I want to achieve in in my racing career racing a stock car in the US is is super high. So put a lot of work into that. And, and that led to the deal with Belfour and Bill McAnally Racing to, to race in, in ARCA at the end of the year. So I'd been in touch kind of on and off with, with Bill McAnally literally since I started racing cars about doing something, um, but never had the budget to, to come and obviously make something happen. So yeah, sort of the the stars aligned and um, then led to a lot of hurdles. You know, the international travel was banned. The US had shut their borders. So literally had to go to the White House to get permission. Um, NASCAR had to put a request in with the White House itself to allow me to enter the country. Um, and then, yeah, boarded a flight to, uh, to, I think I came into LA or San Francisco and it was such a weird sense, weird experience, like literally like eight or nine people on a triple seven, um, which was the best flight I've ever been on, obviously. <laughs> and um, yeah, landed in the US, kind of had to negotiate my way through customs with like a massive folder of documentation as to why I'm allowed to be here, all of obviously COVID tests and everything like that. And then, uh, yeah, onto the race, obviously in in COVID times, there was very limited practice and, and testing before. So I had a, a kind of 10 lap shakedown of the car at all American Speedway, like a three eighths mile short track. 
um and then a 20 minute practice slash qualifying at phoenix and it was straight into my uh, race debut it was it was very different you know the the arca car or kind of us stock cars in general um a lot heavier a lot more power you know three four hundred horsepower more than the the euro series car and the euro series car is a little bit of like uh a compromise between like a late model and a touring car where it has coilovers it, it's a lot lighter um obviously it's built solely for road courses so everything's straight um so yeah there was a there was a degree of adaptation even in the arca level there's a lot of kind of aero dependency and and playing around with things to make that work you know little things you can do with the body and and things that they don't check for on templates um so yeah, it was it was tough in a way um, because obviously I had such limited experience. But on the flip side, that was kind of a good thing because I didn't know what I didn't know in a way. So I could just go in completely fresh slate and start from scratch. And I did a lot of of running on iRacing and as much as I could to prepare in advance. I had uh, TJ Majors as my spotter for uh, for my ARCA race. Obviously, race run with Dell Junior. Uh, Logano Kozlowski um, has a ton of experience so ran around on iRacing with him for a couple of days I think with the Euro car like the biggest thing you have to keep up with is obviously as the tires wear and you know being able to square off exits better and focus on your, your corner exit whereas with the uh, with the oval stuff and the ARCA car not only are you keeping up with tires you're keeping up with brakes you have tire fans so you can change the balance of the car as you know if your right sides or left sides are getting hotter or colder but then the track itself changes so much whereas on a road course there's normally one line and you stick to that line no matter what whereas especially at phoenix where they used the the pj1 and had that up at the wall and um you know that's something i've never experienced before where there's like two three different potential lines for each corner and you have to sort of play about and figure out which is the best one and then obviously you can also use different lines to help you with overtaking and and that side of things as well it was awesome you know it's one of those where you always want more you always want to um improve but i think for the amount of experience i had going in and the amount of preparation time i had in the actual car or, or there at the at the track i i was pretty happy you know, we we didn't qualify great. Obviously, I had 20 minutes to learn everything, basically. Um, but moved through the, the field to the point where I, I finished 13th in the end. The second half of the race, um, I was the fastest McAnally car on track. And my teammates were Jesse Love, who won the championship, Gracie Trotter, who was a TRD driver. Um, so compared to my direct competition, by the end, I was super, super happy with, with what we did. You know, it would have been nice to know what I knew at the end of the race, at the start of the race. And I think we could have done significantly better um, or to have another crack at it, you know, knowing what I know now. But but yeah, on the whole, for a debut was was super, super happy. We we ran an MBA car at the ARCA test at Daytona as well uh, at the start of that year, at the start of, start of 2021. Um, and there was a kind of a big grand plan to do a lot more, but unfortunately, like a lot of things, COVID and general business not being great in sort of 2020, what 2020 to 2021 sort of put a put an end to things. But um, but yeah, the the car looked amazing. <laughs> We just announced Jensen Button, Formula F1 world champion. He's going to be joining us at NASCAR, running three Cup Series races this season, starting at Coda. That is the car and the paint scheme you will see him in, which is very exciting. Well, for a very long time, I've, I've watched NASCAR, uh, a couple of decades. And I have to say, growing up in the UK, uh, we had four channels on TV back then, back in the late 80s. Um, and uh, we didn't get any real sport outside of European sport. Um, so you're going to like this. So it was actually Days of Thunder that, first of all, brought me to NASCAR <laughs> because it's the first time I got to see any NASCAR. Um, I mean, it was a movie. So, you know, as an eight year old, I thought it was insane. Um, I thought it was amazing. Worlds away from, from European motorsport. Um, but that kind of got me in the door of, of of liking NASCAR and I used to watch it with my old man um, and yeah it's it's so different to what I'm I'm used to uh, and I think
that's probably what stopped me asking the question whether I'd be able to race in NASCAR because it's so different to to anything I've driven before. And and also back then it was more it was more ovals. It, there weren't really any street courses, so um, that didn't excite me so much because it's another skill set altogether. But now there are more road courses. It's it's definitely more enticing uh and also i think i i would be more competitive the atmosphere is great and that's that's what i really love about nascar about all the different series in nascar uh but especially cup series you know the, the it's the it's the family atmosphere that's that really that really got me and uh you know speaking to jimmy johnson you know he says my kids come along and they're playing with everyone else's kids and it's 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 that thing that you know that part of it that really adds to the the, the interest for me but if they don't go well, no, there's, it's not going to go well for 2024 in terms of getting a drive or, you know, for a full season. So, yeah, I mean, if I if I like the championship, if I if I like the car, if I think it's fun and, and enjoyable and I can be competitive, there's always that possibility. But but as I said, you know, it's it's a lot of learning um, in a very different way than I'm used to. I can't see him doing full time NASCAR, but yeah, I mean, we've never really managed to make a UK driver in NASCAR work. Dario Franchitti, for example, tried very hard, but didn't didn't really get there. It's a tough series to be in. I mean, it's 36 paying races and two more exhibition races. That's a big slice of the year. So uh, yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's a whole different culture. charm in regarding nascar i think today it has a much much bigger appreciation of its european audience i think euro nascar is a case in point you know it's, it's gone that far and i think nascar is looking beyond its borders more these days and um realizing that there is a market to be exploited internationally and that there are an ever-growing number of um European supporters. Um, I mean, there are Facebook groups in the UK. They've got thousands of members, you know, many thousands of members. And um, so, yes, the NASCAR has a much higher profile over here these days. And I think it's a very slow process, but the American authorities are beginning to realise it. And also, when you go into the, when you look in NASCAR, when you look in the people in NASCAR so involved you know in the teams that so many of them are british <laughs> there is so much there's british british engineers british firms providing much of the hardware i mean the electronics and mclaren the brakes are ap racing it's all uk stuff so yeah. there is a big involvement so it's you know it it, it is slowly becoming recognized rocking in motor speedway was forced to close in 2018, only to be bought by car sales company Cinch in 2021 for £60 million, with the track being returned to its former glory. Could we see oval racing return to the track? When something's gone, it's gone, unfortunately. I don't, I don't believe that you'll get the people back. And plus, the big thing is, is if you do, then it's got to be a proper event. So it won't be just, oh, well, pickup trucks are going back there and we might find a few old stock cars that might end up going and putting on a show. That that, that won't work. That won't, I'm sorry, but it won't end up working. Yeah, I know the facility is still there. There might be the money behind it there still as well, but you need to go there with a proper, with a proper package, a proper, a proper whole setup. It may yet reach a point where NASCAR says, OK, this is so big now, we've got to do something about it. Um, how soon that will happen, I don't know. But yeah, NASCAR, NASCAR is certainly going to keep growing. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that whatsoever. Um, in fact, it can probably keep growing in Europe as it faces bigger challenges in its home country, which is quite interesting because, you know, uh, so, yes, I, I, I see NASCAR growing and I see the potential. What we basically need is someone like Jonathan Palmer of Brands Hatch to think, oh, I buy up Rockingham. I could do something with that. If, if only that had happened, then it might have been a very different story. But, yeah, um, 
NASCAR will continue to grow and at some point there might be someone who thinks it's worth having a punt and taking a second attempt at building an oval, but it's a big punt. And what about the racing package itself? Could we see a domestic premier American style stock car series in the UK in the future? Like we once did with Eurocar and Ascar? It's very difficult to present a true NASCAR style series in a market that doesn't have the infrastructure that they're used to in America. Um, the only problem is, as you say, NASCAR has moved to more road courses, but then in Europe, if you're, if you're trying to do an, a NASCAR style series, but you're running it on road courses, it's very difficult to differentiate it from what you already have in Europe and what you've had in Europe, because we've had big, meaty uh, saloon series in Europe in the past. Uh, so it's just another race series. You know, to really do a proper NASCAR series in the UK, you need four or five ovals and the, and the series going around those ovals. Uh, and the whole image that comes with that. So uh, it would need someone with very deep pockets. I think you've got to look at everything that's happening in the world. So I don't think it's about no longer about ended up having big V8s out there and everything else. But then you end up, because we have an involvement with that, with that particular product, then is to end up using most likely the Mustang and that ends up being the Mustang turbo engine and it's a four cylinder engine and maybe the cars don't have to quite be as big as what their brothers are in America, if you like, but it still could end up. But, but my fear ends up being is, is that we've been going for now, how many years it is, 27, 28 years or whatever. And even though that we have ended up being spoken to or we have had conversation with America, they've and some of our drivers have ended up going over there to race, and they do understand the product, but they've never ever sort of attached themselves to us, and it isn't ended up being. I know that you've already suggested like places like Brazil and everything that they've ended up putting budgets in place for them, but we're not even asking for money really. It would end up just the fact that you could carry that NASCAR badging for a start off or they just sanction what we were doing what we have been doing is correct and just ended up giving us the support that they can give without it actually end up even being funding or money or whatever because i think it would then end up making it making life easier or not making life easier, but it would be easier for us to go to product partners because once you've got that name with and I call product partners the people that are suppliers to the championship and end up and it would insist it would assist in helping that side of it grow and ended up most likely end up being able to end up funding the costs of of what it costs to end up putting them events on or running that championship. After all them years that nobody has ended up coming along and ended up saying, you know, Thanks for what you're doing. You're, you're helping the American product. You're helping this and everything else. And what we would like to do is end up, can you carry our badging? You know, can, can you come under our umbrella? Perhaps that's all right. And that's all we want is be umbrellaed by them, really. I mean, they, they've got all of the infrastructure out there. They've got all of the knowledge. They've got everything and everything. They, they'll have the contacts as well. So if they turn around and said, oh, well, this is what you... We would like you, you, you as being part of Europe, if you like, to end up, to end up, us as a company being SHP to build the product, if you like. The extension of that would end up being is, oh well, this is the contact, this is the man you need to see to end up getting the body shells. This is a, you can get them body shells; they will come to you, or if not, we'll we'll give you one body shell. And at that point, can you find somebody in Europe, in the UK, that can end up making them for you so you haven't got all of the shipping costs? You know, there's, they've got so much knowledge that they would be able to assist with. The key to the whole thing now is ended up being it, it shouldn't be down to SHP for a better word to come up with the concept and everything. We're either got to find a number of investors that will end up supporting it and going from there 
but I think the key question will end up still coming back from ended up where I said earlier, and that's ended up being NASCAR. NASCAR should end up saying, well, you know, we've done it. We've done an acceptable, an acceptable job, not an exceptional job, an acceptable job to get it to where it is now. Now we'll end up helping you to end up now. We want, we want to see a Ford Mustang series out there. That would yeah. be the dream. That would be the dream.